Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you love these programs, you can join the channel directly on YouTube at even $1 a month or head over to patreon.com slash Aksum. Today, our special guest is Razib Khan, one of the only two people I'm a paid subscriber of on Substack, so you know he's writing some good stuff. Uh, welcome to the program, Razib. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I got to say, um, when you reach out to me and, you know, we talk about genetics and stuff, uh ethiopia is horn of africa is on my spreadsheet of like to do so oh uh, nice i think i'm gonna move it up a little just because like well for various reasons but um i think i i think i should i should, I should move it up a little i think i should move it up a little because i think it'll be like super interesting and i mean you'd be interested but i think a lot of people would be interested it's, it's an interesting i'm interested there's still some mysteries there too i think um that yes you, that be figured out, and maybe I can ask you about some of the stuff. But I, I was just gonna say, if you need yeah. any consultation on the non-genetic stuff, we can yeah. definitely uh, talk about that, um, you know, on camera and off. But also, I have some questions that may help unreveal reveal it too. There's this weird thing, like what I start off with um, in talking about that, and we'll come back to you. Is like, and there's this thing that they call like the Solomonic uh, dynasty. By the way, I got. Uh, a signed print copy of unqualified uh, reservation from Moldbug the other day and a great quote where he said Ethiopia matters. So I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people from very different groups. Um, yeah. From yeah. like Garveyite black nationalists to uh, everything else under the sun, like Rastafarians, like all these different groups. Well, so I, I don't ask a question about this. Um, um, you know, I know Egyptians, uh, like frankly, just like kind of racist against Black Americans now. Yeah. Um, because of the cultural appropriation and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like I've known some Ethiopians, and I mean, I'm gonna be honest, like pretty racist, you know. Uh, but it's not as extreme as Egypt, right? It's very different, and it's it's almost split fifty fifty. And you can probably guess there's a gender slash sex thing going on. So the thing is like when uh there's a big difference also between in ethiopia versus in america but let's just like bring it to just america there are i would say the more westernized that they are there's kind of two types of ethiopian the one who tries to assimilate with the wasps and the one that tries to assimilate with the black americans so the one that assimilates with the black americans is going to actually self-identify as black and everything like that the ones that identify with the wasps um uh, maybe maybe not and it's usually like the foreign born parents that will say like the problematic things and make a huge distinction between black americans i actually did a live stream the other day with the very clickbaity title of like are ethiopians black and one of the things i do is one of the things we're going to do is like look at it from a genotype perspective a phenotype perspective and a cultural like assimilation because it's a very complicated issue to yeah. be honest. well i mean i'm thinking in phenotype i'm as black as you bro yeah <laughs> I mean, well, my skin at least. I mean, I'm, yeah. looking, I'm looking yeah. at you and I'm looking at a guy who's the same color as me. So, you know. Yeah, well, and and um, that's part of the things that uh, I want to ask you and talk about too, especially um, some of the other mixes. But let's go back a sec and um, go to a little bit of your biographical sketch. When you were a kid, did you say like you want to be into and do population genetics when you grow up or like generic scientists? Uh, like when I was a kid, because I'm older than you, when I was a kid, I mean, First of all, population genetics, it, it's always been like a little bit abstruse, but, um, you know, it was definitely like not about humans at all. Um, it was about like Drosophila and fruit flies and stuff like that. And it was a very obscure little um, ghetto. You know, I have a friend who told me in the early 1990s. Well, so actually my former browse, Spencer Wells, um, some of you will know from Journey of Man, National Ge Geographic Project and stuff like that. He, um, when he went to Harvard in the mid 1990s to do population genetics, uh, his undergraduate advisors at UT Austin were just, they were despondent because wow. it was, uh, the perception was it was a dying field, nothing was going on, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone went into like molecular biology, biochemistry, this sort of like biophysical biology. So that's what I understood about biology um, as a kid. I was interested in evolution. I was interested in physics. I was interested in a lot of stuff, mostly STEM. I got later interested in history, maybe when I was 10. Mm -hmm. I just have a lot of different interests. Um, my family is a STEM, you know, you know, just one of those stereotypical like engineers, doctors. Although I have like um I have ulems on both sides, so like religious scholars and stuff like that. 
as well. That's part of our, you know, whatever. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I didn't have like a very strong idea of what population genetics was, but um, I was always interested in history, or at least since I was about 10. Um, and then um, I was always just interested in anthropology uh, and I guess like human variation. Um, you know, my family's from Bangladesh. Uh, my dad is very dark skinned. My mom is very fair skinned. And, you know, like their friends would joke that we were uh, we were biracial. I mean, it was just, <laughs> I mean, these are like Bangladeshi, Bengali, Indian people. But it was just, yeah. like, you know, my dad is like you say, Scala, you know, like he's, he's, he's dark, dark brown. And my mom is very light brown to the point where, you know, my mom is light, light enough that, you know, the type of like Indian or like South Asian person mm -hmm. where, you know, someone who's Southern Italian might speak Italian to them, you know. So, same thing with me, by the way. Same exact thing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's so I, you know, that was like something I noticed since like and and obviously uh my siblings and I are kind of mostly in the middle. There's some variation, but mostly in the middle. Yeah. So you, you kind of see that in the family. And is then, that a testosterone thing, by the way, or is it that they have different like genetics? So I know what their genetics are now, and you know, a priori I would have said that their genetics are different, but actually um it's just because and I, maybe i should write a, a post on this but their genetics are very similar except my dad has some brahmin ancestry mm -hmm. so he's actually has more of a northwest indian shift than that my mom um i mean i knew that genealogically but like it's, it's it's evident in the genome my my dad is enriched for like european like ancestry compared to my mom it's just that you know uh, just random there's only a small subset of snips or markers that actually explains skin color variation. So about like 50% of the variation is due to like 10 markers, right? 10 genes. The other 50% is kind of like a parallel distribution. There's like several, there's like maybe another 100 positions, right? But really 95% of the variation is due to 100 genes, okay? Whereas your whole genome, your ancestry, it's like that's your whole genome, right? It's a much more uh, variegated thing. And also like my mom has a little bit more Asian, East Asian ancestry, like Burmese type ancestry. So some of her like lighter complexion might actually be more South, Southeast mm -hmm. Asian. And honestly, um, when I'm less tan, I'm a little tan right now because I've been running outside in the Texas nice. sun. Um, but uh, you know, which I think gives me some nice color. But uh, I, I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie, like I think I look a little sallow and um, you know, yellow, you know, and th this is a thing among I mean, also like I know Ethiopians also talk about red and yellow and things like yes. that. And so I think that has to do probably with my subcutaneous fat and probably like maybe I have a lot of East Asian. I mean, you can check my genotype online to confirm that I'm because you can download it. I have like, um, there are some South Asians you will meet with more East Asian ancestry, but they're like always from Assam, you know? Um, I'm one of the most East Asian and South Asians you will, you know, Indian subcontinental people you will meet. Um, I'm almost 20%, you know? Whereas like if someone's from like say Kolkata or Calcutta, however they want to say it, they're closer to like say five to 15%, really like wow. 10%, you know? And then once you get to Bihar, once you get to like, the mainland of the Indian subcontinent. It's all it's pretty much zero, right? So I'm mm -hmm. about like 80% South, 80% like, you know, generic Eastern Gangetic plain person. And the other 20% is like Burmese. And so, I mean, I see this in my family, you know, we're from the very Eastern edge of what is today Bangladesh. Um, my, my, my family, um, we were part of what was called low country Tipura. So it was part of these like princely states in the far East. And, um, you know, there are people in my family that look very East Asian. Uh, and, like I have like I have like a relative. His nickname is Jackie Chan, and it's not because of his like martial arts styling. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, there's some weird stuff related to that, where you know, obviously we're self consciously brown people, we're deshi, you know what I'm saying? But then like some people kind of don't quite look like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then like there's no real explanation. When I was a kid, I noticed some of my family members looked kind of Asian. And even I, I mean, I don't think I look super Asian, but sometimes I can tell in some angles, like I look a little Asian compared to a typical brown person. I have very little body hair, like you guys can see, like, you know, you know? so there's <laughs> some stuff. Ne never, never shaved in my life. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, I've never, but wait, people shave their forearms? Oh, uh, definitely. <laughs> okay, anyway. Like uh, bodybuilders, power lifters. Yes, yeah, that's whatever. fair, that's yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so what I was just going to say, though, is, uh, you know, there's this variation, and I was kind of curious about it, and I asked my parents and my mom, because, like, she has, I mean, it, you can see in our facial, in her family's facial features in particular, um, some people with kind of like East Asian features, like, 
Actually, no, my dad's side too. Like a lot of us have like kind of like narrow eyes, higher cheekbones. Like I, it's not very striking in me, but some of my uncles and aunts. In any case, I was asking like, what's up with that? And, you know, my mom told me the story. Oh, there was like a Chinese guy who got lost in Calcutta and then he moved. And so there was like this whole story. And that's the story I would tell. But mm -hmm. when I got the genetic information, my parents are almost like they're very similar in East Asian proportion. It turned out like I looked at the segment lengths. There was no Chinese guy. It was just like, you know, it was like somehow yeah. like 500, like 1,500 years ago, there was an admixture event. It was a pulse admixture event. I checked it in my own genome and nobody really knows what it is. Like there's actually like no explanation. There's no liter literary records of it or anything like that. It's just there were just some people and either they came from Burma or they were there. How you know? far back was the pulse? The pulse is very, very tightly dated to 500 to 680. Mm -hmm. That's just what it is, you know? And there's no, there there was a Tibetan invasion like maybe a century later, so maybe, but it doesn't look doesn't look super Tibetan. It looks more Burmese to me, but it's a little complicated because as um, you know, some of your listeners might know, you know, uh, Burmese. There's like you know the Tibeto Burman languages, and so the Burmese have like both a northern and a southern component in their ancestry. The southern component is more like Austroasiatic, and the northern component is more like Tibetan and kind of like North Chinese. And so when I do an analysis of, say, the genomes of people from Bangladesh, it's more like Southeast Asian, but but it's not quite like Cambodian mm -hmm. or something like that. Like there's also something different that's more like the Chinese, and it's it's because it's Burman, and Burmans are a combination of, you know, like the people, the Shan people are Thai, right? And then the Burmese language is older, it's more related to Tibetan. And then you have some Austroasiatic people that were much once much more common in the South, the Mon people. So it's like the Mon Khmer languages, right? So Burma is like, as you guys know, ethno-linguistically diverse. And you know, um, that bleeds in, it seems, to Eastern Bengal. But you know, there's no history of it. Like it's just all forgotten, not known. There's no oral records. Um, when you look at the map of India, though, there's the the Ganges, you know, goes into Bangladesh. Well, apparently east of the Ganges, which is where my family's from, there are certain accents um, with certain consonants that are actually shared with Burman languages in Bengali. Mm -hmm. So it's like they pronounce Bengali with a, with some sounds that are more similar to um, Tibeto Burman, which is weird. I, I think I know what they are, but anyway, um, but it's just, there, there's a lot there that we don't know, but there's a lot of intriguing stuff. And there's some similarities, I think, to the Horn of Africa. And I think that's why one reason, like, you know, you've been reading me and we probably can talk is, like, there's some similar dynamics here. Yeah. Like, things that are known, things that are unknown, things that are visually obvious, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, some complexity, like the Cushitic languages versus mm -hmm. the Semitic languages. And, like, you know, where did the Cushitic ones come from? The Semitic ones we kind of know, but, like, you know, how are these two related and all that? absolutely even the the way you talk about this like chinese man it's like i wouldn't even call it falsehood it's like a it's like a legend or a myth that's metaphorically true it's like yeah. describing something in very loose language that to an ancient would you know be kind of straightforward but to us it's kind of like offensively false i had that same thing where we have this you know solomonic uh myth yeah. or legend where uh we ethiopians are actually uh we was the jews you know and we're the lost tribe of dan and it was even mentioned in like this recent uh genetic paper which tied us to uh minoan and uh tunisian jews i saw that one people saw yeah that. so like they and they mentioned the whole like tribe of dan as a possibility yeah. being, being one of the sea peoples after the bronze age collapse like like it's conjectural and they admit that it's conjectural but like this thing when i was young i believed it when i got older and kind of like wanted to totally disbelieve it but my attitude towards it now is that it's like pointing at like this other truth of the hybridity that did happen yeah yeah i mean it's on your face so you gotta like you gotta create a narrative right and obviously, um, you can't, you, you, you can't like, I mean, they, they didn't have access to all the tools, all the tools and uh, methods that we have today. So I think it was as good enough as they could get. I mean, yeah, the Solomonic thing is interesting, you know, and I presume most of your listeners know, but, you know, the connection to the House of David and all this stuff. But then it turns out, well, I mean, like, 
the languages of the highlands of Ethiopia are South Arabian languages. They are Semitic languages. So it's not that weird, actually. Um, it's not like they're even Cushitic, you know? Uh, right. They are closer to Hebrew than the ancient Egyptian language was, or is, or Coptic, if you want to consider it a living language. It's not really living, but liturgical, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, oh, am I going to get, am I going to yeah, the, the Coptic audience, no, it's okay. They know, they know, they know. They use it liturgically. <laughs> well, you know what? Swear at me in Coptic. And I'll yeah. like, give you some credit, but if, you, if you're swearing me in Arabic, like I'm gonna stick with that, you know. The funny thing is, it's it's you know so Ptolemaic that it's very heavily littered with ancient uh, Greek, like Koine. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so yeah, uh, I think it, it's it's interesting because we are, uh, you know, you we we were talking earlier before you got on about liminality, and there's so many mm -hmm. places in the world that are liminal, and so uh, you know, I think Ethiopia definitely. Is, is, is a really strong case. All of the Indian subcontinent in some ways, as, as most of your listeners know, like the Eastern, Southeast Asian indigenous with, uh, with the West Eurasian that comes in. And then of course, like, you know, where my family is from, Eastern Bengal is secondarily liminal because there's like a secondary East Asian migration that comes in later. So when 23andMe first, um, you know, in the late 2000s when they had only Asian and like, you know, those of your listeners who are who are from Ethiopia or that area of the world uh, know how weird it was to be like forty percent European or whatever. But like, let's set it aside. So it was like European, Asian, and uh, African. So these were Yoruba, um, Chinese, um, and uh, the C E you know C E P H Northwest Europeans. And so I was like fifty five percent Asian. And everyone was really confused because there's very few brown people. There were a few Bengalis at that time on the platform. And most of the people from the Indian subcontinent were like 30 to 40% Asian. And so I was like, uh, but I, but you know, then I like looked at myself on the PCA and I was like, oh yeah, like I'm like off the climb. So I have something separate, different in me. Right. So you can, you can kind of figure things out. And now we're coming to the, position where like genomically we have almost all the information we need but like how do you interpret that um in terms of history so for example um you, i'm sure you know about luca pagani's paper from like 2014 i think now or 2013 about ethiopia and his admixture dates are quite late you mm -hmm. know and i mean look they're really late in terms of like um were there like 100 percent full south arabian people without any sub-saharan african admixture in ethiopia in 500 bc because that's what his results would imply and i wrote this blog post i don't know if you saw it about like um that maybe the ethiopians mentioned in the iliad um is, is it memnon was it memnon who was ethiopian anyway there's ethiopia there's ethiopians in the iliad okay but they're not really described from what I remember because I read some translations when I was a kid as like black. But maybe that's because they weren't black. There, there's this uh, weird thing with the term Ethiopia. So it it like literally means like dark or burnt face in Greek. And it's yeah. used in uh, different ways in the, in the Bible, like which also kind of correlates to how it was used in other Greek. If you're thinking about the Septuagint, the Greek language of the Old Testament and the New Testament Greek, it kind of refers to like the Nubians or that original Kush, the area in like Sudan between Egypt and even including like Upper Egypt, which is in the south, uh, to Ethiopia. And there's actually a monument at this site called Adulis on the on the coast, uh, which is in modern day Eritrea, yeah. that talks about how the Aksumites conquered the Ethiopians. So it's a weird. This is part of like the the complication that you're talking about because like my people directly kind of conquered those Nubian Kush, original Kush, Kingdom of Kush, uh, Moro civilization, took their name, appropriated, culturally appropriated their name, but they also happened to share a lot of DNA with those people. So it's, yeah, it, it's, yeah, people oh. from the Indian subcontinent. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, I guess, like, uh, the question that I would have would be, so, um, you know, and I've read a little bit about Ethiopia, but not too much. So mm -hmm. you have the South Arabian, you have the South Arabian related languages in the highlands, like the Amara language, the Tigray. Um, and then you have Oromo, uh, like the Cushitic ones. Mm -hmm. So Afar, uh, Somali, yeah. So the, but the, so the, but I mean, the, the assumption is the Cushitic languages were the languages that were there in the highlands when the South Arabians came, right? 
Uh, correct. And there were also two other sets of language which were in a smaller minority, which be, and that was actually one of the questions that I was going to have for you, the Nilo-Saharan languages and the Omotic languages. And, and they're still kind of there. And then either the Omotic peoples, which are associated with the language, or the Nilo-Saharans, one of the two were the original. One of the stark differences I see, for example, like I think you've written about the Dinka before, who are like one of the tallest people on earth besides the Dutch. Uh, the Dinka are like a part of that Nilo-Saharan group, which is yeah. like in South Sudan and obviously in Ethiopia as well in the Southwest corner. But then you have these uh, Omotic people and the Omotic people's DNA is actually closest to the Moda man. If you've seen the Moda man from the Cayman. Yeah, I know, I know the Moda man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the Moda man actually clusters closer to the Omotic people, but those people are like all short. Uh, and so I don't know if height has to do with anything, if those are like two different types or strains of East African. Yeah, I mean, they seem like they're deeply diverse. I know David Reich has told me, you know, they, they were always surprised like how little West Eurasia, because there is a little bit of West Eurasian signal even outside of like, obviously the Ethiopian, look, look, a lot of Ethiopians just look like Arabs, like Arabs with curlier hair. Or like, and there's, I mean, there's like, it's like the gap between some Ethiopians and Saudi, it's like they meet, you know, like there's some Saudis and it's like, yeah, are you Saudi or are you Ethiopian? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I was a Lyft driver for a while, a few years ago, and I was driving a Saudi girl and I pronounced Jedda correctly. And yeah. she got nervous because she was not covered up and she thought I was a Saudi guy. And I was like, no, 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 I'm Ethiopian. <laughs> and so she's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my number. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, but it, you know, it's interesting. I have to say, like, not from a genetic perspective, but like sometimes you look at the, you know, the faces are very distinctive, and Ethiopians have very distinctive faces. They look very different from West African faces, and even you know, East African faces, or like you know, further south, the Bantu people, or even like the Dinka. But um, I swear to God, like the faces, they look like Arabian faces. Okay, and this is one reason I always so there's this argument. Um, Pagani, I think his he saw that the genetics indicated Levantine ancestry instead of Arabian. But if you do simple yes. and naive admixture, um, and then you got the Minoan. So I'm going to tell you what my take on this, and this is not like super Please. well informed, but I've thought about it a lot. There's all sorts of weird artifacts with the level of admixture you have into a population, and how you can use that to infer you know, doning, don't, don't, you know. So for example, Sardinians are donors to everybody. Mm -hmm. But that's because Sardinians are not admixed. And so they resemble a lot of ancient populations. So the whole thing about, um, oh, well, actually the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians were European because they were like Sardinians. No, no, the ancient Egyptians were ancient. And the Sardinians are liking the modern ancient population. So there's this weird issue with the drift and like some rare variants that are coming in that are spreading recently. And that means that it inflates Sardinian relatedness to all ancient populations, right? It's it's a little bit like a statistical artifact. It's a real thing, but it misleads a lot of people, okay? Yeah. And so I wonder if something similar is going on with these signals that, oh, it's Minoan, oh, it's Levantine. In terms of when those people came from Arabia, you know, or wherever. I mean, the Cushitic people might have come from a different area, okay? But I think, like, Ethiopian languages are like South Arabian languages. So they better have come from South Arabia, right? So I do think they came from South Arabia, but I think what happened here is Arabia itself has changed subtly, all right? And so that means that all of a sudden, um, in some of these more sophisticated drift-based analyses, like F-statistics, uh, you know, the Arabs are not the donor. The donor is like Natufians or something like that. But that's because the ancient Arabs were a different people. Not mostly different, but different enough. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I had uh, looked at some of this stuff before because that was always the narrative. So one of the things we know for a fact, like culturally, is that we borrowed and then adapted the South Arabian script. Yeah. And then there's other things like uh, inscriptions with Sabayan next to Gu'uz, which is our language, which made them think that. It, it kind of led me to think, though, that they were Levantine only from like you mentioned, the modern like Yemeni populations, which would be in that area, their non-African DNA does not connect. It clusters with like the modern, you know, Southwest Asian. And then they actually have strains of African DNA from when Aksum had conquered that area and left some African DNA there. So wow. I had not connected it with the, with the Yemeni before yeah. that reason. And I, I kind of, I know what you mean. Like all the, what they have is these population banks, modern populations and ancient populations. And they're telling you like what your 
most like. So for example, uh, you're right. I, and I'll tell you just kind of briefly, like, like my bio sketch as a kid growing up, I grew up kind of mostly in like Hispanic and then later in, in white neighborhoods. So I kind of always conceived of myself as very dark and kind of full black or full African, whatever that means. Cause every ancestor in every way that I know for a minimum of 3000 years has been in Africa. So that kind of, uh, diluted me. And I didn't even like recognize any facial differences until I got to college where I got a lot of black friends and they kept like demanding to know what I was mixed with. Like some would say half black, half Arab, half black, half white. But then they would say like, even like they're like some black folks have a red undertone. You got a red overtone. Like the words they would use, they just knew I was different and I kind of wouldn't acknowledge it. 2016, I take my first DNA test with 23andMe and it told me I was originally 66% sub-Saharan African right, when they're early data and 30, whatever, 3% uh, North African. It goes, it goes, it goes. Now in 2023, it just tells me I'm 99.9% .9 Ethiopian. I'm like, that's not very helpful. It's cool they gave yeah. me my, my haplogroups, but then I recently took it to illustrative DNA, yeah. which gave me kind of comparisons to modern yeah. and ancient. I sent you a picture of like the ancient populations. So the Eurasian element is mainly two different things. Like the big one is the Natufians, and the other one is Zagrosian. And I understand that these are like Natufian-like or Zagrosian-like, not exactly quite these Eastern people. Western. Yeah. Eastern Could you explain Western what, because that's a funny word. Could you explain who the Natufians were and who the yeah. Zagrosians were? The Zagrosians aren't even real people, but they were just recently made up for <laughs> genetic purposes. But, um, so the, I mean, they are, but so Natufians are well known because they're probably, well, they're one of the first, if not the first, the first agriculturalists, probably mostly the Southern Levant um maybe into like a little bit of the sinai northern egypt and the, you know maybe into syria like you know modern syria which is more northern levant and so natufians are an, I, um they're, i think they were like originally they're directly out of foragers in the area and then they're the first agriculturalists really it was probably more of an evolutionary process but i mean they're a big deal right um jericho all of these places so the early natufians are distinct from modern people in the area because what happened is um there was that mixture. There's also Anatolian farmers who are kind of closer to Natufians to Zagrosians. Let's not leave that those aside. Didn't what show up in mine, but it showed up in other populations I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there might be a reason it didn't. So what happened during the Holocene is there was mass admixture in the Near East. So basically, um, stylized fact, if you look at uh, uh, FSTs, pairwise genetic distances, Zagrosians, like, 12,000 years ago, so that's like at the end of the Ice Age, the people in the Zagros Mountains in Western Iran and the people in the Levant, like Israel, Lebanon, Syria, um, were genetically distinct when mm -hmm. you look at pairwise comparisons of their SNPs as Chinese and Northern Europeans, okay? Wow. And this is and this is mostly because like these populations are isolated, they're small, they're drifting apart. So they're very, very distinct people. Um, the Zagrosians, obviously Western Iran, it seems like they come from some of the same root populations as the Natufians, but they also have connections with populations in the Caucasus and maybe into Central Asia coming in during the Pleistocene, which makes sense, all right? Um, it's just like there's a big desert in the middle, the Syrian desert, and you know, in the mountainous side, there's connections into like Siberia and the Caucasus and Central Asia and all that stuff. The Natufians, on the other hand, probably are connected to North Africa and the ancient North African populations as far west as Maghreb, right? And so they're like two different, you know, ends of this. And then what happens with the rise of agriculture and trade and civilization is they start mixing. By the time we have the Sumerians, like 5,000 years ago, it looks like, um, from what I can tell, and like using like various admixture uh, software that researchers have used, they've been thoroughly mixed. There's still a, a spectrum. There's still a spectrum. Um, there is more Zagrosian in the Zagros in Iran, mm -hmm. and there is more Natufian in the south and the west. But, you know, even in, even the ancient Egyptians had a non-trivial amount of Zagrosian. Um, but the pre-pottery Neolithic, um, which is like a particular term, like pre-pottery Neolithic, right? Really mm -hmm. early Neolithic that went into South Africa. I remember like uh, Pontus Skoglin told me there was a woman in Tanzania. I think she dates to about like, is it like 2000 BC? Something like that. Um, a pastoralist. You know, it's they think, oh, maybe she's Cushitic. Yeah. Uh, they have no Zagrosian. So it's the pre pottery Neolithic. It looks like it was an early uh, expansion out of the Near East. And uh, they don't have the Zagrosian. They're pre exchange. And so I think one thing that you're seeing with the Horn of Africa population is they're like reduced on Zagrosian. This is known. And it's because 
most of their ancestry probably came from before most of the exchange. Right now, if Pagani is right and it was 500 BC, that doesn't make any sense. No, yeah. So the what I had read outside of him is that, and it, it, that seems to map onto the Cushitic people, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is that that pulse event was about 23,000 years ago for them coming to the Horn of Africa. And there's an interesting north-south dynamic where, so mine is around 46%. And, um, you know, like with about 45% Easter, East African hunter gatherer, but there's the Tigre, which is the minority language or Tigre it's called in Eritrea. Some of them are 70% Natufian. Like I've, I've talked with some people who got 70% Natufian, which obviously brings their East African ancestry down to like 30. So uh, some of them are, or rather more like 60% uh, Natufian and like 10% uh, Zagrosian. My Zagrosian was about 6% and my Natufian is about like 46. So it, it, it seems like they were all through the horn. But another question I was going to ask you about that too in, in comparing the populations, if I'm not mistaken, it seems like, and the way I've tried to describe it, you could tell me it's wrong, um, that the Natufians were Eurasians, but they were dark-skinned Eurasians, something like the Cheddar Man or something like South Indians, like in terms of how they're Eurasian, but they're dark-skinned. Yeah, I don't know if they were that... And then the Zagrosians are lighter skinned, like more modern Middle Eastern. Yep. Yeah, the Zagrosians, I think like last I looked at high-risk plex, because you have to look at those like SNPs. I think that the Eastern ones were a little lighter. Like there's evidence for uh, OCA2 HERC2, which is the blue eye in like in, in Iran. There's an old sample there. Uh, but but um I I'm not 100 percent sure. Part of the issue is like we don't have training sets of ancient individuals genomes yeah. right um i do know a lot of the light skin alleles in europe aside from the blue eye one into western europe came from the middle east so they came from the early farmers so yeah i mean basically the way i would if what i think that probably people look like in the eastern mediterranean that far back is probably somewhat similar but somewhat darker mm -hmm. so you know maybe our complexion are a little lighter yeah. you know not yeah. as brute, like there's more like a brunette white look today i would say in like the levant mm -hmm. um, whereas i think they would be somewhat darker i think agriculture depigmented a lot of populations probably because of um some dietary thing yeah, yeah the uh the the populations that i saw in the ancient populations with the highest natufian besides us in the horn of africa were the canaanites and the phoenicians and then the people who had the highest zagrosian were in the indo-greek period of pakistan yeah okay wait the highest what like the highest Zagrosian, and I, I just from what I yes, saw, yeah, that, makes, like, that, like no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, that makes sense too. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's still like a, a okay, because of politics, we don't have enough samples from Iran, even modern mm -hmm. Iran, super annoying. Like, they're supposed to like put stuff online and then it disappears. And who are you going to email? <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, but um, so uh, I actually like, uh, I'm not gonna like say where because I do some consulting. And I found I, I got a sample from um, someone from Mashhad, and they look they look considerably different than on most of the Western Iranian Persian samples. Uh, they have more step. Um, they're less Arab. I mean, whatever that. I mean, I don't know. It's like there's something in Iran that was diluted over time with like the Arab migrations, especially in Western Iran. If that makes sense. And so it like actually peaks in Khorasan in the Northeast. But unlike people in like Tajikistan proper, they had this person had no East Asian ancestry. So it was like it was kind of like an interesting point on the PCA plot that has like no, you know, samples in the literature because people aren't sampling Iran all the time because of all the political things. Yeah, you use the word step. I know what you're saying just for anyone in the audience who doesn't know. And there are biblical audience members, too, who would appreciate the Scythians are put in certain verses of the Bible as like a group that was considered non-human that they wanted to try to uh, humanize. Could you talk about like the Scythians and, and the step in general, just so people know what that is? Yeah, so I got a bunch of posts on my Substack about this, which you read, um, you know, it's like near and dear to my heart because I am R1A, Yeah, <laughs> a little step lord here. But uh, <laughs> uh, so the Scythians actually, they're, they are, so um, they're really prominent step Iranian people. Uh, the word Ashkenazi is actually from them in the Bible, Ashkenaz from the north. So they came through the Caucasus. They ravaged uh, the late Assyrian period into the early Persian period. Um, Darius the Great fought the Scythians uh, in what was today modern Ukraine. So these are steppe Iranians. They speak an Iranian language um, a, uh, related to Persian, but distant. 
uh, more closely related to, I don't know, like so, the modern day Yagnavi. That's the only real languages, you know, but it's related to Ossetian, the Alanic mm -hmm. languages, that's which are still around. Um, and these steppe people, um, yeah, they're, they were all over the center of Eurasia and they spread, uh, they were the first really great cavalry people. They actually emerge out of the region west of the Altai and Herodotus said that they came out of the east. So they're known mostly from the Ukraine um, in the Greek, in, you know, the Greek, you know, histories, but the theory Herodotus gave is they came out of the East and this looks correct. They look like to be mostly, um, an Indo Iranian people that came out of the Urals during the bronze age, 4,000 years ago, they landed West of the Altai. So, which is like right to the West of Mongolia in you know, modern day, Northern Kazakhstan, Southern, you know, central Siberia and Russia. And they mixed a little bit with some of the indigenous Siberian people. Um, for example, there's some of the stuff in their religion as well um, that looks more Siberian. And then somehow they figured out how, like they they bred some big horses that they could ride on, which is not trivial. Like original chariot horses were smaller, and they rode all the horses westward, all the way to Hungary, really. But also south in the Middle East, they were like a pain in the butt for the Persian Empire. They were called like Sakas. They also showed up in the Indian subcontinent um as like indo scythians so there's all of these terms of these like steppe people um and they go they basically go as far as kurdistan kurdish is an iranian language right um and the iranians themselves the persians they come out of a brand a southern branch that settled in the fars and synthesized their culture with elamites the elamites are the ancient uh bet noir um mm -hmm. with like anshan and alam the two primary kingdoms in that area of iran in the southwest and so the Persians come out of a synthesis of Elamite culture with Indo-Iranian, with Iranian culture, right? With this pastoralist culture. And um, so that was what was going on on that end of the uh, the desert zone. Now, the other end of the desert zone, which I think is more relevant to, you know, like your personal history, um, you have the Cushitic people going southward. Yes. And same thing with the people in Africa. And you see this very early on, like thousands of years before the Bantu ever showed up. So one of the things about, you know, Africa that's interesting, um, kind of could have anticipated it, but it was a little surprising the extent of it. When you look at the first genome-wide association, genome-wide like um, analyses, so hundreds of thousands of markers, and you see it in your own st uh, results that you showed me, uh, the Bantu people, the Bantu languages, like the Kikiyu language and, you know, the language like Swahili, all of these mm -hmm. languages uh, that are dominant, except for some of the Nilo Saharan, like Maasai is, you know, Nilo Saharan, um, Nilotic, you know, and then there's also Luo, which is, you know, Barack Hussein Obama's uh, mm -hmm. dad's uh, ethnicity. But most Maasai surprised me, by the way. Maasai were 20% Eurasian. I was surprised by that, like African Americans. Yes. yes. And so these are, these are, and, you know, and, and but a lot of the, most of the languages are Bantu. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and Dionikis Ponticus, this genome blogger from like, you know, 15 years ago was the first one that immediately pointed this out. He got some Ethiopian samples and he's like, the sub-Saharan African ancestry in Ethiopians is not Bantu. Mm -hmm. okay, which is like kind of like, okay, that makes sense after the fact. But like, there's a lot of things where it's like, you're just like, oh, well, they should be similar. They're right next to each other. Yeah. Well, you know, like it's the Mota ancestry. It's the East African hunter-gatherers, what, what you were showing me. So the the quote black sub-Saharan African ancestry yeah. in the Ethiopians, about half of your ancestry in, in that region of the world is actually a very, very different type of human population than the stuff that was spreading out of Cameroon, you know? And so it's, um, it's interesting because, you know, there's this idea of whether Ethiopians are black or not and like, you know, how they relate to other people in sub-Saharan Africa. But like, it turns out even genetically, um, the part of their ancestry that roots them south of Sahara is actually a very distant, uh, part from the stuff that came out of Cameroon, Central African Republic over the last two to 4,000 years. I'm actually writing a piece. Uh, I'm, I'm writing a piece on the Bantu expansion. I'll give you, a, you know, your listeners. Like I'm, I'm working on it right now. The genomics is actually like pretty clear in my opinion. Unfortunately, um, the archaeology is much sketchier because there's only a few places. Like East Africa is much easier to do archaeology than in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. But it turns out they traverse the, you know, so there's these... Yeah gaps and these are like pre-literate people so we don't really have writing on them so it's really difficult um to get like a rich narrative that to me is satisfying but in any case um, my point here is africa has been totally genetically transformed over the last you know two to three thousand years and ethiopia you know the amotic people that you're talking about but even ethiopians as a whole uh, they preserve within them a genetic reservoir of something that was much more widespread in e East Africa three to 4,000 years ago. So in a way, the Ethiopians, 
you know, in their mountain fastness, are a relic population of sub sub Saharan Africa combined with these newcomers from Eurasia. So part of my confusion as a kid, there was this statement that would be repeated that I didn't have contextualized for me that there is more genetic diversity in Africa than outside. And this is what people latch on to. And that's because of the, um, I forget the the term, the bottleneck event uh, of the, the out of Africa thing, which is another uh, thing that you've written about extensively as well. So just to double down and harp yeah. in on this point and then to go to the, to the bottleneck, but, you're saying, I, I believe, and if what I'm reading accurately as well, is that genetically speaking, that relic East African part or sub-Saharan part of Ethiopians is closer to like all Swedish and Chinese people than it is to like uh, the African part of African Americans okay, and okay. other Bantu. It, it's this is this is complicated. So I am writing a piece that's like in deep editing. It should be out this week. So maybe I don't know when you're going to release the podcast about the out of Africa, it's, it's, it's actually like a little bit more complicated than we knew. Okay. Um, the African part, so this is the way, like I'm gonna give you like a broad sketch real quick, okay? So, uh, and this is like close enough, there's some details, but so humans start branching off, like let's say 150,000 years ago. Okay, the first branch off is the Khoisan, mm -hmm. right? South Africa. Uh, yeah, Khoisan, there's Khoisan branching off. And then there's a second branch. Second branch is like, you know, like West African. So let's think like Mandinka, okay? Um, and that's maybe like, a hundred thousand years ago okay and then the third branch is east african to non-african and let's branch that off at like seventy thousand years ago okay okay so um and then there's like twenty thousand year gap where everyone's like isolated and then fifty thousand years ago the non-africans explode this is why non-africans are genetically homogenous okay everyone like everyone outside of and like half of your ancestry and all of my ancestry like descended from those one thousand people and it's literally not that far from 1,000. I've seen a lot of different models and papers. Mm -hmm. They're all kind of like, they're, they're, I used to say one to 10,000. It looks like it's closer to 1,000, okay? So whatever. So Whereas 1, there were 1, the 100,000 in Africa at that time. Something like that. Yes, exactly. And so within Africa, there was other populations that are deeply, so like, you know, everyone outside of Africa converges back like 50,000 years, okay? But then you have like, you know, some Bushman tribe in South Africa that split off from everybody else in the human race, including everybody else in North and East Africa, 150,000 years ago. Okay. So when they say there's more genetic diversity, yeah, there's like a lot more time for genetic diversity to happen. And so the issue is you have a bottleneck. So everybody outside of Africa is descended from a thousand people. You have 50,000 years to accumulate genetic variation that's distinctive. That's not that much. In Africa, you have, you have like at least two times more time okay another issue is like a lot of african populations didn't go through the same bottleneck populations mm -hmm. in east and west africa went through a much milder bottleneck they did it looks like they went through a much milder bottleneck population in south africa went through a very minimal bottleneck if you want me to ex uh, explain why i think it just has to do with the fact that they're farther away from the northern hemisphere uh you know when the when the ice age peaked in terms of cold and dryness uh, the sahara actually got bigger wow Okay, so um, it wasn't good for populations in you know modern day West Africa and the Sahel region either, right? And it wasn't good for populations in Eurasia. Okay, so you have a situation where um, there's East Africans versus West Africans, you know, and Eurasians are obviously um, it it lo just looks like they're closest to East African populations, but not. Um, excuse me, I gotta see. I put mute. You're good. You're good. So um, David Reich said that Eurasians are descended from a population like the Hadza, which is weird. The Hadza are foragers, hunter-gatherers. They speak a click language. They're unrelated to their Bantu neighbors. The reason he said that is um, East, modern East Africa is much more like West Africa than it was 3,000 years ago. The exceptions are the Hadza, obviously the Nilo-Saharan people who came in from the north, from Sudan, mm -hmm. and Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia and Somalia. In Ethiopia and Somalia... Um, the Bantus did not expand, right? Uh, they were blocked because Ethiopia and Somalia had its own cultural toolkit that was resistant. I don't, I, okay, I've been reading about the Bantus. I still don't understand why they were so incredibly successful. At expanding? Ooh. Yeah, I wondered also if you would make the kind of uh, Jared Diamond geographic argument. People like to point out 70% of the mountains of Africa are in the Horn of Africa. I mean, they are. I mean, mountains help help you, you know, mountains help. They do help. Yeah, that's that's totally true. Um, but I mean, 
Somalia is not mountainous. No, no, it's not. Those are the lowlands. You know, so there are some pastoralists and pastoral like Kush it looks like Cushitic speaking, like the, the Sandawi yeah. people. You know, it looks like there's Cushitic ancestry in East Africa. It was swamped though by the Bantus. Um, they originally didn't come with iron. Iron they picked up later, but then once they had iron. So I think that there's some cultural and like this is why like the Bantu piece is taking a while. I need to figure out what their killer app was. Okay, <laughs> so Indo-European step people, it's obvious like the horse. Yeah. Right. Uh, like their mobility. Um, but with the Bantu, it's not quite clear. They picked up cattle culture later. It looks like uh, they were very very promiscuous at picking different things up. Um, so you know maybe they were just adaptable. I don't know. But my point going back to the Ethiopians is. Um, you know, Ethiopian heritage preserves something that's deeply rooted in East Africa. That's been mostly erased. Now, we could say it was genocide or it was absorption. To be honest, I, everyone that I've seen, the genetic uh, impact of the earlier pre-Bantu populations across East Africa is actually like, pretty low compared to your expectations. Uh, you know, we're talking like less than 10%, really. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, say, the Indian subcontinent, it's 50-50, you know, between, like, you know, indigenous, ancient indians and then the eurasians that are the west eurasians that are coming in you know yeah um, and ethiopia itself is like about 50 percent, you know indigenous east african 50 percent west eurasian you know yeah. but in, in in east africa in kenya tanzania um the indigenous people are mostly erased when you go into south africa you have to hit the uh, fish river where the mediterranean car starts climb uh climate kicks in and that's where the Khoisan kind of held their own you know but everywhere else, it was totally genetically transformed. So Africa, during the days of ancient Egypt, was actually genetically totally different. You know, I mean, from what we can tell, I mean, definitely like, you know, the Ethiopian uh, highland populations were not there then. You know, they were probably like later, ex later expanding from the coastland. Cushitic population is probably there. You know, mm -hmm. so the Queen of Punt that had Shepsut uh, sent a mission to. You know, I'm assuming it's some Cushitic, you know, population. The people that, I mean, she looked like really weird, like she was deformed. They didn't really look like Sub-Saharan African to me, but, you know, a lot of these things are very stylized, so you never know. But quite clearly, the people on the coast to the south at that point, they were not Bantu. Um, a lot of them would be like Hadza-like foragers. People probably, I mean, people definitely more close to the Mota people. So, there, so Mota is this site. It's the first ancient DNA from Ethiopia 4,000 years ago. Um, there's now more. Some of it's older now. But the point with Mota is when you do a, a when you do ancient DNA a transect um, when you do like the genetic relatedness there is like a continuous uh, distribution all the way to South Africa to the Khoisan. What the Bantu did is they broke it, so there's like a massive gap uh, between the Khoisan and everybody else because all the intermediate populations quote disappeared. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not gonna say what happened, but I don't yeah. think it's nice. Th those those who can infer can can say that. Um, taking a step back just briefly, because you mentioned the step again, one of the kind of uh, puzzles I had was, did the uh, so-called Zagrosian, like you said, it's kind of like we're making up categories, did they have any step in them? Is that part of what you were saying when you said they had some mix with the North potentially, like what was North of them? They didn't have step, but the, the step had them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's really, so I mean, for, for the listeners out there, it's like complicated, but I, I know I, the step is like half, kind of Zagrosian related and half uh, Eastern hunter gatherer from like the Baltic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you merge those two together, but then the step itself expanded into the Zagrosian zone. Right. Yeah. And so then the Zagrosian people, then the Iranian people have this hunter gatherer, but they have like a branch of their own selves. And then later in Western Iran, I think the Arab expansions help mediate the spread of like more Natufian like ancestry in Western Iran than it used to be the case. So when you look at like ancient Indus Valley civilization people, they're a mix of some ancient indigenous Southeast Asian thing, more like the Andaman Islanders, and then something that doesn't exist anymore that has almost no Natufian and is all Zagrosian. Wow. Right? That's why like the original statistics were kind of weird. Yeah, I, I see that. By the way, whenever you have to go, you can just do it and we'll make it abrupt. Um, but um, like, that's what was uh, interesting in the the different expansions and, and the mix. I am like, uh, in thinking about it, just trying to see what everybody is. I guess um, my next question is, you kind of made this statement when you made a, a great guest appearance, by the way, go check out uh, his guest appearances on the Red Scare podcast, if you can get there behind the paywall. And also Colin Hughes. Coleman Hughes. Coleman, Coleman Hughes, both, both, uh, very fantastic. Actually, in both, you kind of mentioned 
there are two things I want to ask you that you mentioned. The one is you made this statement that who's kind of like the middle or the mean or the average, I don't know what the correct word would be, uh, within uh, the human race. And then you would say like, it's kind of Ethiopia. And uh, that surprised the, the hosts a little bit, but then you went and explain it. And some people were, uh, I, I shared that comment of yours and some people were saying, well, not like total population rise, right? Right, With, like how populous the Indian subcontinent and, and Chinese are. What did oh, you yeah, mean yeah, by yeah, that yeah. statement? So I'm, just, I'm, I'm not, okay, like I'm talking about like genetic variation, yes. like not waiting for population. So for example, you know, and I, and I'm, I wrote, I'm writing this in my Out of Africa piece, 85% of the population in the world descends from those 1,000 people. But that's not most of the world's variation. Most of the variation dates to Africa to two to 300,000 and further years ago, right? And so the bottlenecks have reduced the variation in the non-Africans, and that's why there's more variation within Africa. When there's more variation within Africa, it's not necessarily even like population to population, it's just within an individual, right? So if you're 100% African, you have like say 10 to 15% more genetic variation within your genome. Right. So most of them. So I have like, like concretely, like I could have like 4.5 million SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms out of the 3 billion base pairs that are different from the human reference. You might have 5 million. And then someone that's uh, um, from uh, from South Africa could have like five and a half million. So, wow. yeah, no, that that helps. And then the second thing is like, is this just an intellectual curiosity of yours, like you said, from childhood that you're picking up? Or are there actual uh, consequences? Like we don't have to talk about, uh, you know, IQ. I think uh, Coleman had had mentioned it a little bit. But like, for example, um, people usually pretend like this stuff doesn't have any consequence. You know, everything is a social construct. But then is there like 23 and me told me I can't hold a pitch well, which is true. You know, I'm, I'm a bad singer and I'm bad at like memorizing uh, melodies. It told me uh, I was surprisingly fast twitch muscles, which it said is good for strength training rather than what I thought would be like the slow twitch, like long distance, which Ethiopians are, are known for. Like what are the medical consequences of yeah. this information or any other consequence that you could think of? Yeah. All right. So I have to jump off. So I'm going to end with this. <laughs> good. Thank no, you. Not, Thank you for your time. Okay. This is a big deal. Um, so organ donations, okay? So my kids are mixed race, uh, which means that I really hope they don't need an organ until, I mean, that's why we need stem cell organ organs, actually. Um, so basically, if you're going to get an organ from someone, uh, the probability that it's going to be someone within the same ethnic group versus outside is way, way higher. And that's a massive issue with people from ethnic minorities. Uh, frankly, you would have a problem because there's not that many Ethiopians in the in the data set, right? There's a lot of black people, but like those are black Americans that are 20% Northern European and 80% West African, which is very different from your own profile. Um, so me, like obviously, you know, there aren't that many South Asians in this country, Indian Americans, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, whatever. And then people who are mixed race, uh, they have a unique profile, you know? So I have friends who are, like I have, I have friends who are like a fourth Japanese, a fourth black and half European, okay? So they look really cool, but their organs, <laughs> their genetic their, their genetic profile is very unique, which means for immunological matching, there's some issues, right? So um, biology matters. We are biological creatures and um, you know, we are, we're the product of our evolution and our history. And that doesn't mean, uh, I guess I would say, it doesn't mean that we are that different, but we're different enough that we should study it, right? Very good. Thank, thank you so much. And when you mentioned uh, immunology, that means it also impacts like things like vaccines or no connection. It could impact vaccine reaction. And so a lot of yeah. a lot of the pharmacogenomics ethnic work has to do with like drug reaction because people react differently, you know. So, um, you know, watch this space, as they say. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you plug everything? Uh, where can everyone yeah, so find you? You can find me all my stuff. Just go to Razib.com. There's all the links. Razib.substack.com is is my Substack. Uh, you can follow me Twitter Razib Khan. Um, yeah. And, uh, if you want to like edit with my Wikipedia page, make some nice, nice edits, you can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 